Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the 10th session of the Sustainable Insight series. Firstly, I would like to introduce our organizing team from UNESCO Jakarta. My name is Cairo Hazlan, MFIT coordinator, and colleagues from UNESCO Jakarta, Ms. Felicia Angelina, Mr. Gani Mulia, and Mr. Cipta Yamato Sanda. Our topic for today will be sustainability partnerships through a business lens in the new normal. We proudly present Professor Shabas Han, the Director of UNESCO Regional Sciences Bureau for Asia and Pacific as the moderator and our guest speakers at Jung Professor Mr. Anthony Wong Kim Hui, Group Managing Director of Frankie Penny Hotels and Resorts and Mr. Yaya Winarno Junardi, President of Indonesia Global Compact Network. We are ready to take your questions through the Q&A space and comments at our Facebook page. Professor Shabas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear Hazlan. Today is a wonderful day. We are going to talk to two very uh, eminent senior colleagues I have been working with for several years in Indonesia and in Malaysia. Uh, Mr. Junadi is the president of uh, the global uh, UN Global Compact uh, Network chapter of Indonesia, but also has played many roles globally has been associated with many businesses and knows the UN system very well and uh, also has been guiding many programs of UNESCO. We have celebrated many events of uh, United Nations together and created greater awareness among businesses and have done projects too. And my other very special colleague is uh, Professor Anthony Wong, uh, who has been also the president of the Global Compact Network uh, in Malaysia, he's running a very interesting business in what we call Langkawi a Global Geopark, uh, which is a UNESCO Global Geopark. Uh, while he is making sure his business is successful, at the same time, he's teaching others how to be green and how to be profitable. So let me begin my first question today, and you are most welcome to ask your questions through uh, the Zoom or through the Facebook Live, and we will endeavor to answer those questions to our eminent colleagues. So uh, I begin with uh, uh, Fajunadi, who is today in Jakarta, like me. And uh, Fajunadi, looking into global compact network, there are very interesting principles on which global compact network is based on. One of them is about human rights. And also very importantly, to make sure there is fairness in the labor and in the markets. It's also about anti-corruption. And very importantly, now making sure we don't leave anyone behind being inclusive, what we call the sustainable uh, development goals. So can you give us an idea with uh, Indonesia and your leadership? So many businesses are part of this initiative in Indonesia and uh, you probably bring these initiatives all the way to New York. So what drives those businesses uh, to take this initiative very seriously and what is their role and how you link with civil society, academia, the multinational and national. So it would be good to get some idea from you from the perspective of the UN Global Compact Network. Uh, thank you, Prof. Shabas. Uh, as you know, uh, that uh, United Nations Global Compact was formed uh, in the year of 2000 as the uh, follow-up of the famous speech from the uh, late Kofi Annan, Secretary General at that time in the World Economic Forum, saying that why the new business and we, global uh, United Nations, to work together in a global compact to give the human face to the uh, marketplace. So that was the idea of starting of the United Nations Global Compact. Uh, so that it was formed uh, and we have uh, 10 principles which uh, consist of the four pillars, the human rights, labor, uh, environment, and uh, anti-corruption. So uh, that's what we have been doing now. Our, our, our mission uh, in the countries in local network is how to advance and mainstream these principles uh, within the private sector, uh, specifically for the business sector also. And also at the same time now, when uh, having this sustainable development goals, okay, it's really matching uh, so much because these uh, 10 principles of global compact, okay, uh, 
is parallel to the 17 goals of the United Nations Global uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, because some of them are uh, human rights aspects, some of them are environmental issues, uh, governance, okay, and of course, uh, also one very important thing is also partnerships, something that we are going to, uh, we, you know, we need to, to do it in order to achieve the SDGs. Thank you very much. That's really a very nice overview that there is a very good alignment with what uh, these responsible businesses want to do with the United Nations Global Compact and become part of those businesses which are recognized for all these principles. So let me ask the same question to Professor Anthony Wong, who is today in Langkawi in Malaysia, sitting by a very beautiful beach where we have been many times in his hotel. So uh, Professor Anthony, what does it mean from the point of view of owner of a resort who is uh, uh, first uh, priority is, of course, to make sure that you make enough uh, profit to, as a business to survive. And how do you bring these uh, green development ideas and sustainability ideas? What drives a business like yours to be more green and more sustainable? Uh, I, I will give a little bit background. I started yep. inbound travel in 1976, a company called Asia Overland. And we mm. started nature tours, you know, long house, homestay, family. Uh, so th it was all nature based. And from there, you learn about, you know, community being affected. When you go to the national park, it's the local community. And I got into the travel, I mean, the hospitality business in 91. Uh, when we open up a hotel here in Langkawi, but Langkawi was not well known. Three years later, we sold it. I came back here again in 2005. Mm. Uh, we, we started many firsts in the country. We started white water rafting, mountain climbing, uh, so four-wheel drive, scuba diving. A lot of it was my hobby, not for making money, but have a lot of fun. Okay. But when we bought the hotel this time in 2005, we took an old hotel. I say I got to do what you call walk my talk. Yeah. So I've been talking about sustainability. I've been teaching ecotourism for, in the whole Asia Pacific region for 30 odd years. Now, when I started, the academia did not understand tourism in 44 mm -hmm. years ago. So. I got involved in the academia. I taught in many universities to make them understand and taught the government what is inbound tourism. The Ministry of Tourism was only started in 1986. Yeah, I started in 76. Wow. So today, I'm always teaching the academia linked with the, the, the government. So always there is a partnership working together, an NGO. I'm also on the board of architects and engineer, the green building. And I'm teaching the engineer architect on sustainability because there's a lot of things. Sometimes when you're out of the monodiscipline, you're multidiscipline, you can see things much better. Yeah. So Wonderful. since we purchased the hotel, we started with 25 ways 15 years ago. Today, we're over 200 ways. Yeah. So uh, we need to put it in the book so that people can understand that it's not complicated. It's very simple. It's just a matter of creativity and some new ideas coming in and we can save between 10 to 30 percent operating costs yeah it's always better to build from the beginning uh, then you don't have to do renovation but this is not taught in any hotel school you may do a little bit in architecture you may do a little bit in engineering and you may do a little bit in natural sciences but you have to get everything together so you know and and when Global Compact was mooted out, uh, I became the first president uh, to push this agenda. I say I'm so involved in so many things. Uh, I stepped out of it after four years, actually. And uh, you know, uh, Linla, Linla was the secretary and she took over the place later on. So it's so important to understand the 17 SDG goal because yep. that will give you a term of reference and we use that. And to make it work in our hotel, we are always teaching others all the time. So I'm actually uh, teaching at the hotel association for the last 10 years, four times a year, at the architect association, at the engineer association, and also in the university. Yeah. So I believe 
the private sector has a very important role to play because they are out there working, the academia, uh, you know, if you don't share the ideas with the academia, they do not know what's happening uh, actually. And also when they are aware, we can employ them, the engineers, the architects, the biologists, because this is what you can apply in real life. That's really an excellent overview that it comes from your own personal drive all the way to bring all those multidisciplinary aspects. And I'm very pleased to learn that you have now from 25 to 200 ways to sustainability, which we will explore in a moment. Let me go back now to Pajunadi. You have mentioned very importantly the sustainable development goals. So um, Pajunadi, you have been a champion for many of these SDGs with the UN system in Indonesia and in New York. We have organized uh, the World Water Days together and we have been working on the issue of the small islands by bringing responsible businesses together. So let's explore the SDGs idea. The SDGs are number one principle is leaving no one behind and also making sure that we have the uh, all the principles of sustainability well embedded in a cross-cutting way. Now with the COVID happening, many economies have already slowed down. There are positive and negative impacts on businesses. So can you give us an overview from where uh, Global Compact views that uh, what are the kind of impacts the businesses are already having and how it will impact on the SDGs and making sure that we don't leave people behind while we have to struggle for the bottom line of the businesses. Pajunadi. Yeah. Well, uh, I, the way I look at it is this uh, COVID pandemic is a wake-up call. Uh, mm. It is uh, something that we, the community, the business, the country, learn on something that maybe have not be, uh, we thought before. And uh, you know that the business has been impacted a lot. There are some business uh, have the negative impact for this COVID. Hotel is one of the examples. Mm. Airlines, transportation is another example. Logistics is another example. Automotive industry is an example. So there are businesses, there are sectors where uh, there have been a negative impacts. And, and as a result, of course, you know that there is a increasing unemployment in Indonesia, something like close to 6 million uh, people lo losing the jobs, okay, adding to the whole poverty issues and so forth. Now, at the same time, there are uh, a good business, I said good business because of this COVID, you know, the pharmacy, the healthcare, the online delivery, uh, food still going on and so forth. Education is another problem, you know, the school is closed, but now we need to start talking about this new way of education. Okay. Mm. So now, uh, then uh, with all of these things, you know, how can we talk about all of these SDGs? In my opinion, in fact, the SDG becomes most important for today because of this COVID. Okay. Yeah. And the way we do the SDG will be different from what we think before too, because of what because this new normal, you know, we, we, ask, we talk about the new normal, some people talk about the next normal. Okay, uh, ne new, the new normal is uh, the new way of lifestyle, mm. the new way of doing business. Also the new normal uh, is a wake up call for us to rethink the business models, like Professor Anthony also mentioned, and also see the new business opportunity at the same time understand there are some also obsolete business uh, in the future. So with all of these, uh, because SDG is holistic, uh, yeah. we are talking yeah. about all aspects from the uh, poverty, uh, education, health, water, uh, climate, and jobs, and all those things. These are all holistic. So now when the, gov the business now starting the new way of doing, restructuring, then uh, you go along with the whole SDG thing at the same time. So I think, uh, and, and this is also why uh, uh, Secretary General Guterres, very recently in the 20, uh, 20th anniversary of Global Compact, uh, also he mentioned that we are behind the track for the SDG, but it is now time mm. to accelerate the implementation of SDG and urge the business uh, to do uh, more aggressively 
and also Global Compact. Now we launch what we call the UN SDG Ambition Goals uh, for the business to integrate the, the principle of the SDG into the, to, into the core business. So, so if I can ask you a follow-up question, uh, Bajanadi, uh, you said new normal. Many people don't know what new normal means. So Indonesia has its own definition. What yeah. in your view is the new normal uh, which we are trying to align ourselves with? Yeah. There's been a debate now, okay, saying that health first or economy later. Or economy first or health later. Okay, in my opinion, the, the new normal is a, a combination of doing the new way in the business, but also with a precautionary uh, uh, in terms of the healthcare and well-being. So we do get now. Uh, you cannot get the economy stagnant, okay, and then create poverty and creating unrest, and then finally impacting health. Okay, but you cannot just only talking about health, but uh, there is no economy going on. So it should be together. So to me, a uh, new normal is, as I mentioned, is a new lifestyle. It's a new way of doing business. Being to adopt the technologies and innovation, mm. adapt the business more effectively. Uh, to new normal also mean to me that uh, the need to enhance the cooperation and partnership among countries uh, mm. to address the global challenges. Because you know, with COVID, you know, you cannot stand alone. One country is impacting another country's supply chain is a problem and so forth. So new normal now be creating the needs for people to really think mm. about having a partnership all together. New normal also means that uh, uh, we need to start to, to look at the issues of the environmental biodiversity loss, okay, uh, and then uh, the need to, to refocus on the implementation of the sustainable development goals, balancing between the economy, environment, and social justice. And the whole thing is new normal, then what we need to do is a change of mindset of the leaders, being in the government, or being in the private sector, being the universities and communities, that we have to uh, do the new way of doing now in the future. What we are doing now is not a new normal. Now we are yeah. not going to, we, are not, we cannot do offline meeting in Langkawi, but now we are doing online. <laughs> yeah, we are meeting together in this parliament. This is really a very important definition for us. So new normal is not only health, not only economy, also making sure all these aspects are there with the new technologies as we are meeting here today, but also businesses are bringing new innovations and we are maybe more aligned to the sustainable development goals with the biodiversity and the environmental mindset and the uh, green. Let me go now to Lenkavi, to Professor Anthony <laughs> Bajanadi. Uh, Charles Darwin said something very interesting, Professor Anthony, some time uh, ago, which was 1859, long, long time ago. He said, it's not the strongest of the species. It's not the most intelligent of the species, but only those who are most responsive to change will survive. So, oh, your business, we have been watching. We have many of the meetings in your resort in Lankawi. Uh, you have given lectures to our colleagues from all over the world. How ha your business has uh, changed uh, as this, uh, there are lesser international tourists coming to Lankawi and uh, you have to deal with the kind of new normal with the uh, Junardi has described, how it impacts on your business and how have you adapted to this change? Okay, uh, for Lankawi, I would say 80% of its population, 115,000 people, we have three and a half million tourists. So 80% depend on tourism. Now, we do not have any more international tourists. Same as my hotel, 80% are international tourists. Now, if we were to do normal, I cannot afford to pay my staff. Yeah, the business must survive first. So yeah. for me to survive, I need to reduce my overhead. So I got no choice, but I retrench everybody. I take back people who are willing to multitask. That means if your front office, which will they only work three hours a day when the flights come in, they have got five hours, say one hour for lunch, they got four hours. So I say, look, if you are not busy at front office, why can't you do housekeeping or you do some cleaning? 
Now the old team, they do not want to do. They say, uh, well, the labor law, don't, we've got specific job tasks. So now I've taken a small group of 17, but we just operate 32 rooms. We put under Airbnb, but multitasking. Okay. Before we, we go to the full force, we teach them and train them first. But at the same time, you see, only when the company can survive and they are profitable, then I can take this and do more for the community. If the business close shop, nothing for anybody. The other thing is, Langkawi import 95% of its food. Mm -hmm. Imagine 150,000 plus three and a half million tourists, how much food is imported? But there's lots of green area abandoned. So mm -hmm. a month ago, a group of uh, business people, hoteliers, restaurants, and community asked me, Anthony, you're the most green person in the country, if not on the island. What do you suggest? So I say, look, I've been organic farming for 15 years. I'm about to launch my organic farm school in Kuala Lumpur end of the year. I can teach them organic farming, integrated. No, no need to buy anything. Everything comes from waste. So yeah. we are launching end of August and there are eight landowners who are willing to give the land free to the youth. And then in return, later on when they sell the product, a percentage goes back to the owner. So the local com community are getting themselves together. But the problem is don't have knowledge people. Don't have people willing to work the garden because the, co the local community has been planting paddy and they don't really want to do too much work. Yeah, very easy. You plant the crop, you know, sometimes one, two times, but the government gives subsidy. So they're very comfortable with government subsidy. Yeah. So I believe this is also an opportunity for people to think more when their children, you know, when the government subsidy is no more in September, when the wife is hungry, the children are hungry, they are hungry, I believe they will go back to work on the land. But Knowledge must be there, so we are willing to teach this for small fee, just to pay their lunch. Yeah, yeah. because if you give everything free to people, nobody appreciate this. I so we want I them to, uh, but we will do a pre-qualification. We will do an online course in Malay for the local community. If they qualify for the online course, then we take them on because always everybody jump in. There must be some pre-qualification. Now, yeah. the government has their hands full and they may not have budget or, you know, they may not look at us as a proper NGO. We may take this to crowdfunding, yeah? So that, yeah. you know, there are many people who are willing to help out in, in the local community. So there are things that we, we have to do out of the norm. But, you know, uh, this is also an opportunity. Like, for example, you know, my... Uh, we've been doing water. You know, one of the SDG goals is water. I've been yeah. doing wastewater using constructed wetland for 28 years. Now the government understand. And uh, we are doing this also on the island now, uh, converting some of our monsoon drain to wetland to mm -hmm. clean the water. So, uh, Junahidi, happy to share this because we're also talking about regional assistance. The knowledge yeah. is there, but we can help each other because this is a global issue and water sure. is key to life and farming. Yeah. So happy to do that. You know, when there's opportunity next time you come to Langkawi, come over. In fact, uh, today I got a couple from South Africa. They're looking at how I can uh, show and teach uh, constructed. Well, I can treat any polluted water to drinking standard, just using different variety of plants and in the design part to go class one drinking standard water, not class Great one drinking. wastewater, class Wonder. one drinking standard water. Uh, that's really the uh, innovation which you have brought, uh, Anthony, and you're already uh, prompting uh, our dear colleague, Junadi. Uh, 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 so that's where, if I can recap, with the COVID, of course, things have slowed down. There are yes. impacts. You have to adjust and from a, a full hotel model, you have come to a b, &B model to adjust yes. to the market according to Malaysian customers. But at yes. the same time, 
there is a big issue in Lankawi, which is a UNESCO Global Geopark, and the tourists will come back again. Rather than yes. importing 90% of the food all the time, teaching them how to grow food organically and using your resort as an example, as a teaching facility, which you are already doing. So that's really wonderful. But let's now take your lead, Anthony, and go to uh, Vajunardi. Uh, you have said that we need this regional cooperation. And that's where we have this Malaysia UNESCO cooperation program. And the intention of the Malaysian government is let's learn from each other. Let's bring where possible Malaysian expertise, but the other expertise like Indonesia, like Pakistan, like India and others. But at the same time, also let's link with small islands, link also with uh, Africa. So uh, coming uh, to this uh, challenge as... Uh, um, Pajunadi, you have given us the idea that in the new normal, no nation can deal with COVID by themselves. And right. Anthony has said that he's willing to give this regional training and we will take on under the uh, synthesis program of uh, UNESCO. How Global Compact promotes this cooperation? How do you see the value of South-South cooperation? beyond the immediate COVID uh, challenges of vaccine, the medicines, the pharmacy related things to the longer term sustainability of people and the businesses, how this cooperation uh, can go to the next level following uh, the situation we are in. Yeah, certainly, uh, as, as I mentioned to you that uh, this uh, COVID uh, pandemic, okay, uh, uh, creating or urging people really to cooperate one to another and certainly including also South-South cooperation. So I will take the offer from uh, Prof. Antoni. Okay, <laughs> uh, we are going to run this uh, uh, sustainable hotels or green hotels uh, class later on. I will talk to my colleagues in the Global Compact here and how I'm going to do that because that's one of the uh, issues. Uh, we have also a class being done by one, one of our members on the sustainable tourism. So it can be combined together at the same time. Now, uh, a lot of opportunity that really need to be explored okay, uh, in the South-South cooperations, okay, even very closely between the ASEAN countries. Okay, because uh, honestly, when we are talking about these uh, trade uh, uh, volumes, actually uh, Singapore is uh, doing trade more than uh, to outside ASEAN, Malaysia, Indonesia, exporting also to, 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 to China, to uh, uh, to U.S. and the Western world, it's not so much about this uh, cooperation among ASEAN country to be to be increased. So this is the one. That's why you know there is a, a lot of things going on uh, for this uh, ASEAN uh, common common commonwealth uh, in order in order to increase the cooperation. Now, now there, in, there there can be an increase in cooperation in the business, but there can be an increase in cooperation in implementing the SDG one way or not, okay? Being either the water issues or being the sustainable production or being in terms of this uh, uh, issue of the human rights and all those things, okay? So I've been, for example, focusing, uh, Global Compact focusing now three years, uh, focusing on the implementation and uh, dissemination of the UN guiding principle on business and human rights, okay? I think, uh, and I know uh, Thailand is also doing uh, the same thing too, and in fact, advanced also. So we can combine in all countries, for example, clearly how to do the business uh, uh, by complying to the principle of UN guiding principle on business and human rights. Okay, take one example. Uh, the, uh, the other is that about the jobs, mm. about the jobs, okay. Uh, like also in Malaysia, perhaps, and in Indonesia, we have a lot of plantation, okay, palm plantation. Uh, pulp, okay, and we do also in Malaysia, and we have a problem with the palm, okay, in terms of the, uh, how the Europe, European seed, but there are, uh, now, okay, there are thousands of workers uh, mm. in the, uh, in the plantation area, right, okay, you cannot just say working from home, what do you mean by working from home for them, <laughs> you know, yeah. we can be working from home, okay, <laughs> but they cannot work from home, you know, because the home is, a, you know, so, the idea of working from home is different place from one another place. You know. In yeah. the city, in Jakarta, uh, Prof. Uh, you cannot say working from home or stay home to all these people living in the uh, small cottage, okay, and slum. And yeah. 
Yeah, at home then become a problem okay, uh, of, the, of the corona. So uh, example that we have been doing here is that uh, co collaborations between the plantations with uh, another company, uh, Mata Pilar Group, for example, where they are teaching 1,000 women okay, in the uh -huh. plantation area about the herbal medicine. And get, them to, yes, and get them to grow the, the ginger and all those, those things, okay, which turn out to be also uh, something very good for the health. Okay, and so now the, the women in the plantation area have another thing to do, health care, body care, okay, mm -hmm. and then also uh, planting uh, all of these uh, herbal plants. And so they get another activities. Uh, they get another earning because this time the red ginger become a lot of demand because yeah. of the COVID. Yeah. So, you know, this kind of cooperation uh, is also a model that can be expanded to others. Okay. That's really uh, very interesting example, Pajanardi. Working from home means different things than uh, for different people. So right. in the process, as uh, uh, Anthony has created this training opportunity, uh, Global Compact Indonesia is working with the people working in these plantations and thousands of women being trained into doing new creative innovative businesses like uh, with the ginger, Jahi Mera as it is. Jahi very, Mera, yes. Yeah, Jahi. <laughs> so that's really very interesting. It's the innovation which is inbuilt in uh, our genes, but we need to harness our talent to move in the right direction. That's a role maybe for the global compact uh, network and uh, those responsible businesses. If I can go back to Anthony, and I have a specific question. Whenever I visited, and you have mentioned Anthony, from 25 ways to 200 ways of doing business more sustainably, as we started this conversation, we said, is it about putting a few more trees or painting your rooms green or making uh, a few uh, posters somewhere will make your business look green or is green. And many people say to be green costs more. So how you actually bring this power of knowledge and different disciplines uh, for doing business better? Do you do business better if you go green and uh, you are more sustainable? Or is it something because you like and you want to do it, Anthony? Uh, I, I've been teaching for years and years. Uh, about eight years ago, I was asked to teach in the Asia Pacific Accountants Conference. Uh, one of my company is a PCO. We run conferences. And the accountants say, please, do not talk to us about sustainability in terms of we need to earn to, to satisfy human greed. Tell us how to make more money. So now, all my by action, we actually put a, a measurement that you save money. That means you're more profitable. You know, the 200 ways, if people go through on site, they can actually apply in their own business. For example, the air condition, a lot of them have got unit air con, so they have a compressor. The compressor you can actually collect if you're running a 10 to house operation. You can, on a two or one and a half horsepower, uh, compressor, you get about 10 to 12 liters of water. So mm. in your own office, you can collect that water and that could be a toilet flush. Yeah? Wonderful. If you have a mm. large office, you have lots of compressor and it's coming from, from the humidity from the air. Mm. You know? And, and uh, it, it comes in design. A lot of time, if you design it right, then you, you save a lot of money. Like when we purchase a hotel, all our balconies and our outdoor area was made from hardwood. But you mm. know, in the tropics and with the, with the sea, it doesn't last long. Five years, six years, you know, the, uh, what you call fungi will eat the wood. Oh, yeah. And it's humid all the time. So actually, not necessarily wood is good. You build things that will last you a hundred years. So concrete, aluminum and glass will last you much longer when yeah. you're facing the elements. And in terms of design, anything that is always wet, you know, you have water wanting, so you must sort of slope it 5% out. So through your normal eyes, you cannot see it, but water will flow out. So all this in design, in the design itself, you can say 10 to 15% in terms of, uh, of uh, long lasting and in terms of, uh, sort of uh, you know, keep it 
software. Last yeah. so, for example, do you save money or you make more money, uh, Anthony? What you, is your you, take on? You, when you save money, you make more money. Yeah. You make more money so, if you become green right. and more sustainable. That's right. A lot of people think that it costs money, but actually, you put the money in, you save money. For example, when we purchase, uh, when we put in our water tank, it costs us about three hundred thousand, which is about eighty thousand US. You say, what? Why you spend so much and when are you going to get it back? I was doing a, a return of six years, but the water price went up 40%, so return was about four and a half years. Then yeah. when I did my solar hot water, I, I was thinking of eight years return, but electricity has gone up 60%. So the return itself, eight years, will be about six years. So yeah. everything is, is in the, you can calculate back. So even without government's incentive, as a business person, you you put it in, yeah. yeah. You look at the long term uh, return. Now, when we first started, as I mentioned, I wanted to share with you and I also to be more sustainable food wise. So I have uh, about half an acre behind where chicken, duck, fish, vegetable. Now I would suggest, you know, if there are resort like your West Sydney has got quite a lot of land. You could actually create one acre, half an acre of organic food garden, and you can actually market with a much more sustainable, no organic waste goes out, you can compost and you can plant. So even in plantation, you got such a big land. You can allocate, you got thousands of workers, you can allocate 10, 20, 30 acres to be more, produce your own food. Just within your plantation, there is a lot of opportunity to hybrid the operation and to be more sustainable because often plantations are very far away from any any population and food has to be brought in. Right. So if you can tweak it, you will be a lot right. more sustainable and the people will be a lot more healthy. And in terms right. of food, food uh, security, you are more safe as a business. So That's this really crisis of COVID-19 actually makes us think a little bit deeper. How can we overcome I think we can learn many lessons. And also, UNESCO is going to play a more important part. And with the cooperation, South South cooperation, yeah. we can I, bring this yes. we, You link all over the world so that knowledge could be brought over. It could be through yeah. a Zoom meeting. Yeah. And we don't yeah. have to be going on site. We can share this knowledge through this type of platform. Wonderful. So that's really the role for today's uh, webinar also. Uh, if I can ask the same question to uh, Bajunardi, uh, but let's also bring this corporate social responsibility, uh, CSR. That's very important part of uh, all businesses. Uh, to me, it's really the social license to operate. Is corporate social responsibility a liability for businesses or is it really something which can help them embed them better into the local societies and become real global citizens as they say uh, to be the champions of human rights the champions of fair labor uh, anti-corruption how the csr plays uh, for the businesses within global compact and uh, while our bottom line is to be profitable um, there has been a misunderstanding about CSR, and in fact, yeah. honestly, many times misused. Yeah. Mis okay. uh, or if I'm going to use that, another using still using the term CSR. What we need to do is more strategic CSR, not something where the company is saying I have a, 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 a profit here and I'll, I will leave some percentage for this to help somebody else. That's not enough. Okay. And therefore, what we have been talking now more rather than CSR, we are talking about the responsible business. Responsible. So the company should be, company should be uh, dealing the way to do the business in responsibly. Okay. And how, what do you mean by being the responsible? Means that, okay, they are implementing the 10 principles of United Nations Global Compact mm -hmm. on the human rights, on the environment, on the labor and anti corruption. Uh, and at the same time, being responsible means for the company also to be contrib to contribute in the implementation of SDG, wherever mm -hmm. uh, in line with their core of the business. Yeah. So that's the way. Now, uh, 
and if if you integrate that into the the principles, okay, as a part of the core business, okay, then uh, it will be more sustainable, okay, uh, rather than uh, talking about I'm giving away money, okay, yeah. uh, that can help other people. So, so, so this one is something now uh, we just discussed this morning also with uh, some of the organization uh, about how to move the company to that to that kind of things. So, uh, yeah. Uh, if you do so, okay, you are doing the more responsibly, then you mm. will get more preference from the uh, uh, investors. investors. You'll get more preference in the uh, in dealing with the other companies or another on entities who are also caring about the environment and uh, human rights and so forth. Because now it's becoming a requirement. Now more and more the company get the pressure whether you are doing all of these things or not. If you do, if you do it, then the company. If you don't do it, then you, are, you better fix it. Then the yeah. company should be also responsible now to address this into the, to the supply chains. Yeah. Okay. Because then it's become yeah. more important to that supply chain to do if, correctly. If I can explore it further, because colleagues who are not from Indonesia or Malaysia, who is asking companies uh, to be more responsible? Is it the governments or is it a society at large from where this demand is coming for the businesses to be more responsive or is it something which businesses just want to do it by themselves uh, well it's a pressure yes it's a pressure, question to yeah, it's a pressure from both sides okay oh. and number one certainly you know uh, there is there's been increasing pressure from the uh, civil societies that the company should do okay well correctly okay there's a pressure from the international funding Okay, yeah. okay, like organizations like uh, BRF, uh, Principal of uh, Responsible Investment, they only select, okay, and make the investment to this company who comply with all of these things. Okay, it's yeah. a pressure from the uh, government also, okay. Uh, yeah. Not only Indonesian government also, it's not the Indonesian government, it's government from outside. Then uh, we need to have awareness and understanding that actually it is a good for a company to do all of mm. these things. Because when you are doing so, it's your it's it's your own good, okay. Yeah. Not because somebody is asking you to do that, okay. Uh, so and this increasing, with more awareness uh, from the within the company to do that. This is the right way of doing it. More pressure from outside. Then this is a, a in creating for you later on, uh, uh, guaranteeing for the social license, uh, for the <laughs> reputations, okay, uh, for competitiveness. And the whole things that actually back to you uh, become the benefit of the company itself. That's very good. So good to know this. Uh, the same question would be the last one for Anthony from a CSR to being a social responsive business. Uh, uh, what is your take on it in the new normal, as we have said? What would be the okay. new practice for me? Many of our customers, I, I would say 15% of my customer globally book because they understand our sustainable practice and word of mouth, locally yeah. and internationally. And then in Malaysia, all public listed company must follow CSR condition. And uh, now we have the, the 17 SDG goal, but there are no specialists out there to advise them. Yeah. That could be a new opportunity for what you call sustainable specialists. Yeah, because it's a multi-discipline program so I think some universities are actually developing a master's degree in terms of uh, sustainability because it involves so many disciplines. So again, here there's opportunity here. Uh, the public plays a very important role to demand from the business. But the local community, when I first started uh, the hotel 15 years ago, people, locals did not understand. But mm. now more and more educated and they see through YouTube, Google, people are aware. Malaysians are beginning to be aware. I think Asians are beginning to be aware. In yeah. fact, even uh, Chinese from China are beginning to be aware. That's so true. I think that is a big movement. There's a lot of opportunity here, but it takes education and awareness. I think we all yeah. have to it teach. Is. That's the only yeah. way. Yeah? yeah, the education system has to to put in such things, yeah, yeah. sustainability. 
it must Correct. bring it in and that's where uh, i'm very pleased also that within the uh, un global compact network there are many universities who are part of uh, uh, the network as well so academia very important to link with the businesses however the academia itself is part of the business as well so we need to have the link also with the civil society time flies here by junadi you have any final words to say on this yeah, link in, with academia yeah. and with unesco in fact uh, yeah so since you mentioned about academia in fact a lot of these new things on the sustainability on the human right issues on the implementation of environment protection and so forth climate change a lot of things yeah. in my opinion the best education should be through this universities education okay yeah. you know we global compact and others how many people we have but the dissemination uh broadly will be coming and should be responsibility of education uh, people yeah. uh, institution and uh nothing not, one more item i would like to say is that when we talk about the sdg in my opinion sdg is business sdg is business uh, yes that's the way we have to look at it and therefore the business should look at the sdg as part of their core strategy core strategy for the whole society where business is very important part of the society Right. So with that, I thank you, uh, Pajun Adi. Well, just to get the benefit of Anthony, the final wisdom, also this uh, important link because you have been playing a part with the university as well, and you have played a part with UNESCO. You know the global geopa. I think what kind of direction you can give? Where should we go from here? Of course, we will deal with COVID, with the all the innovation which is happening. But in the long term, where do you see? Where are we going? How we will be more sustainable? I think we we talk about partnership. Yeah, I think partners. it's so important that partnership, the business, academia, the NGO, and the government. When we have this type of partnership with an open book sharing, I think yeah. then the progress can take place. Yeah, oh. because yeah. if there's not enough knowledge. to be shared to all and one party is in a dark the whole gear system will not work yeah yeah okay if we, that's if the very, we all depend on each other that's partnership a good inclusive UN. that in partnership with un is uh, you and me i would say uh, <laughs> yeah. that's how we have worked together so yeah. you are yeah. part of un businesses are part of un we are part of the civil society we are have yes. to work together in this uh, right uh, new partnership environment so with that i really thank you and i want to do a very brief summary so that uh, our viewers can recap it has been a wonderful uh, meeting for us to meet with the two legends i would say of indonesia and malaysia the presidents of uh, global compact un global compact network with vast experience of uh, how businesses are bringing these important principles of human rights the principles related to uh, the fair work and labor and the corruption and now very importantly leaving no one behind and bringing the sustainable development goals 2030 all 17 of them and the un global compact has its own 10 points but they are very much aligned with what is happening within the united nations system as a whole so we are very very grateful to have such kind of partnership new normal has been mentioned and in the new normal it's very clear it's not only one side or the other not only the health and leave the economy going down we have to work on the economy and the health together and in this new normal of course there is a role for us to rethink about innovation and technology and very importantly how do we continue to change mindsets to become clearer on being sustainable being greener and moving forward to a future where we are not going to make the mistakes of the past but we build on the best practices as very clearly pajunati has mentioned today that there are many best practices from asean from our country where we are working and the greater region and anthony has shown us how businesses can transform from a hotel to a bnb and a teaching facility to see the opportunity that for an island like lankawi which has so many international visitors every year but more than 90% of the food comes from elsewhere there is a huge opportunity that maybe the food can be produced organically locally yeah. and 
the Frangi Pani Resort with all the excellent facilities being there is already teaching and training. But it's nothing for free. That's an important message also that people must put their effort and their investment so they must have pre-qualifications to be able to understand and do these things better. We have learned also very importantly a concept of corporate social responsibility. It's not about tokenism, but how the businesses become responsible businesses. And in the process, there is new pressure which is coming from all sides, from the governments, from the partners, from national and international and from civil society. The businesses must be more responsive, and that's where the great example of the United Nations Global Compact Network and the partnerships it, is, it has across the world and within countries, like we have heard example from Indonesia and Malaysia, can really be the way forward. Also, very importantly, South-South cooperation, that's where Malaysia UNESCO cooperation program has been working opens new opportunities for us to bring these multidisciplinary approaches. One of them is the offer today from Anthony that from 25 ways of sustainability to 200 ways of sustainability, less publicity together, less work on the training hotels. And Pajunardi has very uh, promptly said, less work together. This is an opportunity. So we see already from a meeting like this, we can be moving forward on training those people. Uh, lastly, work from home is a very important concept right now, but what about those people who are working in plantations? So the example with Pa Junadi has given with the Jahi Mera, that's the term we use in Indonesia for uh, the ginger, which is red ginger. So medicinal properties, local kind of medicines, local kind of uh, new creative businesses, and not forgetting about the women who can play a very big role there. So Global Compact Network has been working with us. We have partnership before for the small islands on the issues like water. And with Anthony also, uh, we have uh, hosted many meetings to show the best practices. We will continue to work together and we would invite both the UN Global Compact Network in Indonesia and in Malaysia to now work together with UNESCO and the wider UN system to continue to promote SDGs, which are even more relevant than ever. And the hurry and the urgency we can see is as we will deal with this pandemic, which I'm sure we are and we will be, post a pandemic, how to build back better will need a lot more knowledge and a lot more innovation and a lot more partnerships. As I have said today that uh, Charles Darwin in 1859 said, that it's not the strongest of the species. It's not the most intelligent of the species, but it is the most responsive species to change, they will survive. And we have heard, uh, heard today that uh, businesses are already changing and they are very responsive and they are very responsible. There are good examples to build on. We invite you uh, to learn from uh, the experiences from UN Global Compact Network and the partnership with the UN and the, uh, the UNESCO especially, and with uh, Anthony, uh, with the, this uh, offer of 200 ways of sustainability. So anyone who is interested to link with us, we will link you with uh, the related reports, and we will be posting some of the work we have been doing in this area. With that, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Haslan, over to you. Thank you, Prof. Shabas, Mr. Junadi, and Prof. Anthony, and to all participants who have joined this event. For the next session on Sustainability Insight by the Japanese Planning Trust, we will talk about crossing disciplines to reduce water inequalities this Thursday, 6 August 2020 at 12 noon Jakarta time. For further information on this, please see the information on the chat room and on our social media pages. If you wish to receive a certificate of, of this webinar today, please go to the link at the chat box and answer a few questions. We keep this form open 60 minutes from now on. We wish you a good day, stay safe, and see you all soon next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Pajanadi, Professor Anthony. Thank you, Professor Shabas, Janadi, and thank Aslan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anthony. Professor, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Have a wonderful day. Bye.